Presented by Caltech. I want to welcome you all today to uh, both to our um, uh, our audience here in the uh, in the auditorium and those of you who are joining us on the web. I'm uh, Ralph Nuzzo. We'll be ha holding a uh, a webinar, um, full spectrum solar energy conversion, hosted by uh, the Light Materials and Inter Light Materials Interactions in um, Energy Conversion uh, Engineering uh, Frontier Research Center, supported by the DOE. Um, uh, we have a and it, just a, a, a terrific uh, 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 host of uh, uh, people to, that will be presenting today, uh, discussing uh, uh, frontiers in, in, in research in, in this area. So um, the LMIEFRC came together uh, in, um, in 2009 as a, as a group of faculty taken, uh, coming from Caltech, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, Berkeley National Laboratory, in Harvard, and, and more recently, with, uh, a adding uh, a number of, uh, of uh, investigators from Stanford University, the work of the LMI EFRC is is uh, focused on on um, material systems and and, uh, and and physical studies that could uh, provide a national resource for fundamental optical principles, you know, for the uh, construction and design of photovoltaics and creating new optical materials for high efficiency solar energy conversion. Um, we have uh, a host of uh, web-related materials that you can access at the EFRC's uh, website, uh, which is uh, 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 given on the, uh, on the first uh, uh, introductory slide uh, to the, uh, uh, to, to the uh, web webinar. And, uh, and we will uh, have uh, a series of talks today that will be presented by our, our speakers to illustrate you know, what are the opportunities and, and forms of progress that are being made against this very ambitious goal for very high efficiency and, uh, and very impactful forms of solar energy conversion in useful and uh, productive forms. And so what I would like to do is to, is to, is to introduce uh, the assistant director of the uh, center, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Carrie Hoffman, who will uh, introduce our speakers and, and provide an overview of uh, today's activity. Activities. Great, thank you, and uh, welcome. So today our first speaker is uh, Paul Olivasados. He's the director of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and the UC Berkeley Samsung Distinguished Professor of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. He also directs the Kavli Energy Nanoscience Institute and holds professorships in the departments of material science and chemistry. In addition, he's a founder of two prominent nanotechnology companies, Nanosys and Quantum.Corp now a part of LifeTech. Dr. Olivasato's distinguished career includes groundbreaking contributions to the fundamental physical chemistry of nanocrystals. He's the founding editor of Nano Letters, a leading scientific publication in nanoscience. Dr. Olivasato's has been recognized for his accomplishments with numerous awards, including most recently the 2014 ACS Materials Chemistry Award. He's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And today is going to be discussing quantum dot luminescent Concentrators, welcome. Okay, good morning and thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here back with many friends at Caltech and uh, virtually with many of you who are on the webinar. Um, as we try to think about harvesting the solar spectrum uh, across many wavelength ranges and with the goal of achieving very high efficiencies above those what, which can be achieved with a single gap cell like silicon to go way above that, uh, and still have an effective approach to that. Um, we are exploring together with my colleagues uh, at the University of Illinois in Ralph Nezzo's group and, and also here with uh, Harry Atwater's group, we're exploring together uh, ways in which we can uh, better concentrate uh, light from different wavelength regimes in a way that's compatible with stacking devices or with making devices that harvest different parts of the spectrum and collect the light systematically. And one way of doing that that is particularly of interest to us is the luminescent concentrator. And um, luminescent concentrators have been investigated for quite some time, um, but they've generally speaking fallen short of expectations. 
And it's only in the last 10 years, I believe, that we've had the combined capability of manipulating the lumophores, which as I'll show you in this case, we'll be looking at quantum dots, as well as the cavities in which those lumophores reside in order to be able to make this concept of luminescent concentrator really achieve its full potential. And so my goal in this presentation will be to, in a tutorial way, outline why a luminescent concentrator might be a good thing and some aspects of the materials that go into that, but uh, also leaving it open for those of you, for example, on the webinar to think about your own versions of these materials because there might be a half dozen different ways to go about doing this that all fall within a similar framework. So. Um, First of all, let's remind ourselves what a luminescent concentrator is. In the luminescent concentrator, we have a film. Uh, it will be uh, typically a plastic film or a, a film of a material that is optically transparent. And embedded inside it are components, small objects, that absorb light and then emit it. And uh, that, uh, that medium is then surrounded by um, mirrors in such a way that the light that's absorbed um, is then and then luminesced is guided uh, towards one part of the device and concentrated there as high as possible. Now, the luminescent concentrator has a relationship to a geometric concentrator. We can imagine having a, um, a, a mirror uh, uh, like the one that you see here on the right uh, that concentrates light geometrically. And what I'll show you today, and I hope that you recall from this, is that for very good thermodynamic reasons, a luminescent concentrator can, in principle, substantially outperform any geometric concentrator. And uh, that's the reason why the luminescent concentrator becomes so interesting to us, or one of the reasons. Um, the other reason uh, I should mention here is that normally when we have, for example, a geometric concentrator, we imagine taking what effectively is a point source, the sun, and focusing it down to a point. Um, but a lot of the solar uh, radiation that we have accessible to us is in fact diffuse sunlight that has been scattered by clouds. And so we would like to be able to collect diffuse sunlight just as well as we would like to be able to collect the point sources. Um, and in fact, there is a lot of diffuse sunlight. Here you can see an NREL study showing um, that the fraction of irradiance that is diffuse um, is approximately 40% uh, uh, if you tilt the uh, solar cell to the proper angle. But if you just leave it sitting flat, uh, then it's closer to 50% uh, or so of the light in typical regions in the United States. Now, that's going to vary depending on exactly where you are. But many places have a lot of uh, cloud cover during large parts of the day. And therefore, there's a lot of uh, indirect sunlight. And that's the light that we would also like to be able to concentrate. So let's understand why it is that a luminescent concentrator can, in principle, uh, outperform any uh, geometric concentrator. Um, Normally, when I give this presentation, I'm holding a laser pointer. But because of the webinar, I'm not allowed to do that. But imagine that I'm sitting here pointing a laser at that screen, and you're seeing that point. Uh, then a collimated beam is leaving my laser pointer, and photons are coming to your eyes, which are distributed throughout this auditorium. And that means that very ordered <laughs> photons that are all moving in the same direction have now become much more disordered. They're all going in different directions. And of course, you can readily imagine that if I wanted to have a device where all of those uh, photons spontaneously that were cut, reversed themselves uh, and came back and into my laser pointer, well, that's not very probable uh, because of entropy. Um, so we know that the order of the photons uh, matters a great deal, and the order has to do with where they are going, their direction, their wave vector, and whether they all have the same wave vector or different wave vectors. Uh, but of course, if we now um, want to have that light spontaneously focused down, we can still do that by paying an energy difference. In other words, taking blue light and using that uh, and having a, 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 a structure in which the blue light is converted to red light and that energy difference between the blue and the red light uh, in this little diagram does give us the ability to have 
uh, the order imposed on those photons, in other words, to take disordered photons and order them again. And that is what a luminescent concentrator does. In fact, um, in a luminescent concentrator, uh, the rule is, and, and right here sitting in front is Eli, who I think did the, uh, Yablonovich, who did the, um, you know, the nicest paper that's out there from, uh, that describes the uh, theory of the luminescent concentrator. Uh, what we see in, when he was at Exxon, I think, probably, right? So a long time ago, uh, and um, since corrected his ways and come to Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> there's a large, uh, 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 if you have a, the, a larger and larger gap between those blue and red photons, the larger that gap is, uh, the more you can concentrate those photons. And in fact, um, in principle at least, if you get up to around 300 milli electron volts shift between the red and the blue light, then you can get a concentration factor that exceeds the concentration factor of a perfect lens. In other words, does better than any geometric concentrator can ever possibly achieve. Now, in the past, this has been uh, worked on extensively with organic dyes soon after the first idea of the luminescent concentrator was, uh, was developed by Goldschmidt. There was a lot of interest in this and many organic dyes were examined for this purpose. Dyes naturally have a certain amount of stoke shift, but as I will show you momentarily, dyes have certain very big disadvantages when we try to use them in a luminescent concentrator because their spectra are intrinsically broad um, because of vibronic coupling. Uh, that's intrinsic to the dye molecules. Uh, but nonetheless, we seek materials where the, we can have a good concentration factor. Now, let's consider the quantum dots, and as I mentioned to you a moment ago, we could look at organic dyes, and the problems with the organic dyes are shown here. You can see, for example, that organic dyes bleach out very quickly in comparison to quantum dots. So if I use an inorganic uh, small crystal, I can have a higher photostability. Um, why is it more photostable? Uh, an inorganic nanocrystal is more stable than an organic dye for a very, very simple reason. One electronic excitation is deposited in the entity, whether it be a dye or a nanocrystal, to, over that entire volume. And in the case of the uh, dye molecule, that might be over 20 or 30 atoms. Uh, in the nanocrystal, it might be over 10,000. <laughs> And now a photochemical degradation event happens when the uh, excitation uh, accidentally gets localized somewhere and performs a chemical transformation, an oxidation or something like that. And the probability of that becomes much greater uh, when the volume is small. That's why dyes bleach so easily compared to quantum dots. Now, but there's another very big difference that goes with that and which has to do with line widths. And that is uh, in the organic molecule when an electronic excitation takes place, and it's localized over, say, 20 atoms, you broke a bond within a 20 atom structure, somehow that energy is going to be uh, resulting in the bond lengths changing inside that molecule at least a little bit. The excited state's not going to have the same geometry as the ground state because there's one less binding electron out of 20. And when that happens, uh, there will be a big change in the geometry of the molecule, which is what leads to the line width of the dye. In contrast, in the inorganic nanocrystal distributed over 10,000 atoms, the degree of vibronic coupling will be correspondingly significantly reduced. So we'll get a much narrower emission, and that turns out to be fundamental to the design of a good luminescent concentrator. Now, if you're thinking about this for a little bit, there is something that we need to worry about here. In the luminescent concentrator, we're going to absorb light and then shift it. And if you're thinking about it, you'll realize immediately, well, we lost that energy. <laughs> I had a solar photon that was blue, and now I've converted it to red. I just lost all that energy. Uh, and that doesn't sound very good. Um, so why wouldn't I just use a conventional solar cell? And there is a very good reason for that. The very good reason is because we can concentrate the photons. So it turns out that, um, yes, we're going to lose that energy at first, but we're going to get it back later when we concentrate the photons down very, very tightly. And uh, how does that work? Um, let's just remember from the fundamental, um, you know, Shockley analysis of the um, efficiency of solar cells that we will indeed have a loss that will come from this uh, Stokes shift. But when we concentrate the photons down to a very high degree, 
we actually change the Fermi level of the medium. In this case, we'll have the luminescent concentrator attached to it will be some conventional electrical solar cell, a tiny area of it, say a gallium arsenide solar cell, something like that. And in it, we will be able, if we concentrate the photons down very, very tightly, to get a very, very high density of electron hole pairs. And if we get a high density, as has been shown previously by Eli and Harry, uh, we will be able to change the Fermi level, essentially, of that semiconductor and get a higher open circuit voltage out of it. So we lose the energy at first when we shift the photons, but if we make a really good concentrator, and really good is the operative uh, phrase here, it has to have concentration factors well over 100 in order to get into this regime, uh, then it's possible to recover that energy loss again by uh, bringing the um, uh, uh, concentration high. So what we would like then is a material which does not look like a conventional semiconductor that simply has an absorption edge and then an emission. What we would like is to have a material that has an absorption edge, some gap, and then an emission. Okay, so absorption, gap, emission, <laughs> and that emission should now sit inside a cavity that completely captures those emitted photons and does not allow them to escape the cavity. Now, um, a lot of the design of a good luminescent concentrator will hinge on that cavity being really good, and it will also hinge on the transmission being really good in this regime where it's not reflecting, but it's transmitting. And one of the keys to the Stokes shift is uh, think about photons. Uh, imagine a lumophore. It's absorbed, and, and the photon is now circulating in this cavity. And just imagine that it's such a good cavity that it sits there bouncing back and forth any number of, of, of times. Okay? There's always a possibility uh, that what will happen is that uh, the, the, the lumophore, the quantum dot in this case, will thermally get excited and emit a blue photon. I mean, it's got a certain absorption probability out here. <laughs> so it could get excited uh, by a thermal excitation and emit a blue photon, which will immediately escape, and therefore you will have lost. And so you need to get this gap to be large. Again, that's the stoke shift. That's why you need that stoke shift to be large, because you don't want any thermal excitation to escape uh, from the cavity. And that's another reason, it's a different way you can think about why it is that the stoke shift is such an important factor in making these things work. Now, um, in practice, what that means is that you need to engineer in a certain way that uh, the low energy luminescence completely stays inside the uh, waveguide and the high energy photons are completely transmitted and that there's a large gap between those. So you have to have this abrupt dropping edge to things uh, that's there in your uh, density of states of your emitter and then a gap and then your emitting state. And that gap has to be in a cavity that's as perfect as possible. And you have to engineer all those things to happen at the same time. And that's why it hasn't worked well with dyes, <laughs> because they don't fulfill those criteria very well. Okay, um, so a quantum dot can. In a quantum dot, what one wishes to do, though, is the following. It's, it's to have a two-component material, one of which has a large band gap, and the other a small band gap, uh, and to nest them, the small band gap material inside the large band gap material in a core shell geometry or a rod-like geometry. It doesn't, there are many geometries possible, but you have to have connected to each other intimately a large gap and a small gap. And the large gap material should be the big volume, as big a volume as possible. And we'll see what as possible means momentarily, but it should be a big volume. And that big volume will absorb the photons. And then that energy will be transferred to the nested gap inside, which will emit them. And so that's the goal of making one of these uh, quantum dot structures. As you can see here, we've made, for example, uh, two different versions of classic material, cad selenide, cad sulfide, which allow us potentially to concentrate photons around 620 nanometers. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, there are many spectral regimes you might want to do this in. At first, you might think, well, wouldn't I want to do this with one micron light? And the answer is maybe, but it turns out not necessarily. For example, we have excellent gallium arsenide and silicon solar cells, uh, but we could enhance their performance, for example, by concentrating 
uh, the red or green light and uh, marrying it to another uh, solar cell and exceed the performance that would exist for that silicon cell. So these materials are very relevant. Um, and what we can do is have these uh, excitations now. We've made these materials, and I think that you can see in this particular case that there's a large gap in the density of states uh, between the strongly absorbing high band gap material and then that emitting material, which is what is desirable uh, for, you know, so in a sense, a quantum dot is almost an ideal, a core shell quantum dot like that is almost an ideal emitter. There might be some that are better, uh, but they're not quite as good at making them yet. So, you know, those, that's what we can do today. Um, now, I did mention to you that there's going to be an ideal size here. Uh, imagine that we keep making that shell bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> At some point, it will start to scatter the light. Uh, is that important? Uh, it depends on how good the cavity is. <laughs> uh, if you have a really, really great optical cavity, I suppose you can keep going. But then there's another limit that you'll hit. If you have uh, an absorption inside a large shell and a very small core, the, the energy has to fall into this uh, well. And if it's too far away, it won't travel far enough to fall into the well before the spontaneous radiative rate of the uh, shell material. So you can only harvest energy from a certain distance into that core. Uh, that's a critical distance. It's going to vary by material. In our case, that's going to be around 20 nanometers or so uh, that we can harvest photons from. But of course, if our, if our core is only a couple of uh, maybe, say, 3 nanometers diameter, and then it's a 20 nanometer, uh, say it's a 30 nanometer uh, diameter, then you've got a factor of 1,000 volume difference uh, between the uh, shell and the core material. So the absorption is really taking place in the shell, and the emission is coming from the core. Um, we've made some versions of these together with, uh, with Ralph and colleagues. And what you see here is, again, is why the emission needs to be, relatively speaking, narrow. And if you can get an emitter that has all these other attributes, like extremely high quantum yield and, all the, and absorption and so on, that has an even narrower emission than the quantum dot, it would be extremely interesting. But the quantum dots have a narrower emission than the dyes. And that's a very important part of this, because you need the cavity to work well at every angle. <laughs> And if you make a, uh, a cavity uh, out of uh, some kind of uh, alternating uh, index of refraction, um, then there's only a finite angle range over which it's going to be a really great reflector. And so the narrower that you can make that emission spectrum, the better your chances are that you'll be able to hold all those photons inside that cavity. Uh, here you can see an example of a cavity in which there's a solution of quantum dots. And you can see the blue photons, which are the ones that are exciting. Uh, and then you can see all the red photons are being trapped inside because it's got that kind of mirror-like quality to it. And using that, we can make a kind of elementary type of test of how good of a luminescent concentrator it is. Now, in a, good co in a concentrator, what we can look at, the figure of merit for us, will be um, the uh, geometric gain and the concentration factor. So um, what we would like to do is have a very, very high geometric gain and a very, very, uh, you know, but also an especially high concentration factor. And uh, think about it as I've got a certain area of, uh, of, of, of a plate, a plastic plate that's got all these mirrors on it. And then on the edge or someplace, I've got a little inorganic solar cell. I want that ratio of those areas to be absolutely large. OK, uh, but I also want the photons to really be very dense onto that, uh, that, that solar cell. And um, in the limit where you make better and better cavities, eventually what will happen is the photons will keep bouncing around, in, around and around inside this cavity. If the quantum yield of the emitter is extremely high and if there's, uh, you know, everything else is good, the photons will just bounce around forever until they eventually find their way into the solar cell. And so you can really do extremely well. Um, with a very high concentration factor. And that's our goal, of course. Um, so we'd like a curve that looks like this solid red one, if at all possible, as we change the area of the device. Um, and so here you can see some, you know, a device that we made recently, for example, which only achieves, quote, a con achieves a concentration factor of 30, which exceeds by a factor of roughly uh, three, the highest efficiency that it was achieved with a dye molecule, as far as I know, roughly, at least a factor of two uh, higher than what's been achieved previously, but still only a factor of 30. And as I mentioned to you earlier, in order for us to recover all the open circuit voltage, we've got to get over 100. 
So where we are now in our research is in an effort to improve both the quantum dots, which didn't quite have high enough quantum yield here. Um, as you improve the quantum yield of the dots, the efficiency goes way up. It's very nonlinear. And also, we can improve the quality of the um, cavity. So we're in the midst of another design cycle at the moment, and we're hoping in the near future to be able to improve upon it. Certainly, all the numbers that we can run on a simulation say that over 100 is achievable with the materials um, that we have. Um, so that's, what, that's where we are at the moment, and we'll just see how far we can get with that. And uh, so um, maybe my concluding thought would just be to say that uh, all we're showing here is a version of concentrating photons at a wavelength of quantum dots that we have readily available. It is, of course, possible to imagine extending this idea to other wavelength regimes, both lower and higher both above the gap of, the, of a semiconductor as well as below it, potentially, even. So there's many different ways in which one can approach the luminescent concentrator. And the way to think about it, I think, is as a basic tool that is one of the many available to those who are trying to harvest the spectrum in the most efficient way. And I just want to thank many friends and colleagues, especially um, Ralph and uh, his uh, many uh, colleagues, Yuan Yao, Lu Zhu, and Lon Fang Li, as well as Noah uh, from my research group and many others. Thank you. It's a webinar, so you have to talk into the mic. They're going to bring you, Harry. It's, it's just one of those things. Uh, Paul, uh, I learned a lot from your talk. Uh, uh, but is there any role that the emission lifetime plays in this? Does it matter what the lifetime of the emission is? Should it be in nanoseconds? or well, it's uh, easier Does it matter at all? Uh, the quantum yield matters a lot. Uh, and, of course, your radiative rates are competing against all kinds of non-radiative ones. And so, uh, you know, sometimes for many processes where the lifetime's radiative rates are slow, I mean, there are many sharp, very narrow states that you'd love to put energy into, but then they're competing against many non-radiative processes and you just can't get good quantum yield sometimes. Um, and certainly in our system, you know, that's, there's all kinds of com competitive rates there to get those quantum yields up high. Uh, the the CAD selenide, CAD sulfide systems have lifetimes, radiative lifetimes in the tens of nanoseconds, maybe 30, 40 nanoseconds range. And there are the non-radiative surface trapping phenomena that are much faster. So, so you know, that, that's the only place where it shows up. But you could deal with, say, microsecond lifetimes. Oh, sure. There's a way to get Absolutely. very large stoke shifts. Absolutely. Is to microseconds can be just fine. Inter-system crossing to a very emissive triplet, uh, that which would, would have a much longer lifetime, but that would be a way of getting a very large stoke shift. Exactly. Now, but remember, you also need a broadband absorption. Yeah. Yeah. But that's right. You can do that. And, or, for example, there are many um, uh, inorganic ions that have, uh, you know, sort of half spin forbidden transitions yeah, that right. are, you know, microsecond right. and even millisecond lifetimes. Right. Yeah. And, and they could be really great for this. If, as long as you can get them to be married to a strong broadband absorber. And that's that last part typically is the hard thing with those, is getting the strong broadband absorber part to work. In Got the, it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question from uh, an online viewer um, who was wondering, you discussed both uh, concentration and geometric concentration. Um, how uh, would you say is the best way to compare uh, with those metrics with traditional concentrators and also against flat plate photovoltaics? OK. Well, um, in our case, what we want, of course, is to have a good ratio between the light absorbing material and the inorganic conventional photovoltaic. We'd like those areas to be big for purely a cost region reason. That is, um, the, uh, uh, you're, we're presuming here that, the, that, the, um, that this plastic film with the quantum dots is a cheap thing, <laughs> relatively speaking. I mean, you know, that's a, an assumption. And, and that, the, you know, so, 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 so for just inside one layer, you'd like that ratio to be big. Uh, but then there's this other issue of the performance improves as you get that concentration factor up. Um, geometric concentrators with factors of hundreds are achieved quite regularly, many hundreds. Uh, and they're even commercial. There's all kinds of examples of those. But 
the disadvantage is, of course, they don't pick up the diffuse light. So, you know, there's many trade-offs uh, between those different types of concentrators. And they are typically being used, to my knowledge, dominantly in single-gap designs. So, you know, those are the trade-offs of the luminescent concentrator. Hope I answered the question. Um, so I guess my question was whether there's any role for sort of nanophotonic photonic design for the cavity. You mentioned the cavity, and I was wondering if there's a way to enhance yield using Purcell effect or something like this to really to think a little more carefully about that aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, the cavities that we've employed have been very simple ones, really. I mean, they've just simply been modulated index films that, you know, uh, and um, there's a lot of beautiful work that says just um, that it's possible to make much more planar designs that, uh, and you know, uh, that, that, that would also work very well. And we haven't done work yet with those in any of the concentrators. I'm not, I'm not sure that any luminescent concentrator has been made with one of those more planar-like designs, actually. They're, they have, or, or I, I don't think so. Yeah, so there's a lot to be done there, and uh, what you say is very, it, it's really good to think hard about how to make the um, cavity be as ideally performing as possible, and there's been a lot of advances in the photonics that are, have not been, we have not yet harnessed, so there's more for us to do there. Yeah, it, seem, it seems to me like that would also work because yeah. the actual, like, the dots are themselves, like, sub-wavelength, right? So, right. I mean, you can, really get to where the field is concentrated in principle for with yes. some kind of designs. Yes. Thank you to Paul for his talk and we'll